We should be live now on Facebook. And if the other panelists could um, share their, their screens. Turn on their video cameras and we will start the webinar. Uh, can't turn on my camera, Lisa, because you have it blocked. Okay, let me see, make a host. It's okay if people don't see my face. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's like, why is that you should all be able to? Yeah, me too, Lisa. Co-host. Should, okay. Not common. Oh, whatever. I mean, something, so. Okay. I think we got it. I think we have it. I think my camera's on. Okay, Lonnie, is it letting you turn your camera on? And she's still on mute. Yay! Okay, and is Van here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, can you turn your video on? Hello. Yes, wait, move on. Hmm. It won't let me. <laughs> oh, there. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Yay. Okay. We are super excited. We are live. Um, we are here this evening uh, to kick off a four-part webinar series that we'll be doing over the next four weeks. It'll be on Wednesday evenings. Uh, U.S. time, 7 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, which is then 10 a.m. in the Philippines, which we have many people uh, from the Philippines who are joining us. We may have others from around the world. So I would just say that uh, any of you who are joining us, um, just remember this time will be the time that we'll be hosting these. We'll also be sharing them out after through Facebook Live and also on YouTube. Um, but it's great for all of you to be here in person because you can ask questions directly. Those of you who want uh, to get this for credit or certificates, um, you know, make sure when you register to indicate that you would like that. These um, presentations are brought on by the Phoenixia Foundation. I am the founder of Phoenixia Foundation, Lisa Valerio, and I'm just so honored to be able to put these on. And we're able to do this um, because of the grants and donations that we receive. Um, so any of you who, um, you know, would love to continue to have these uh, type of webinars continue. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you know anybody who wants to make a donation to an amazing nonprofit, <laughs> it would be Phoenixia Foundation. And you can uh, go to our website at www.phoenixiafoundation.org. And uh, again, you know, anybody who you know would be interested in continuing to help support these webinars, we would greatly appreciate it. So I am going to hand it over. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our our uh, host this evening. There's four of us, myself, who I just introduced. And then we have um, Lonnie Hessen, who's on the line. We have Rafi Garcia, and we Hello. have... <laughs> and we have Van Ebenis. So with that, I'm going to let each of them do a quick little introduction and, um, and then we'll, we'll kick off the webinar. Um, we have opened, we've created a poll. So if all of you could please go in and indicate in the poll, if you, you are a parent, a teacher, um, how did you hear about this webinar? And then the ages of the kids that you actually um, support. Um, we would greatly appreciate that. And we'll have that going on in the background because many people will be starting, coming in maybe a little bit late, um, but it will be there. So with that, um, Lonnie, uh, you're, I'm going from left to right, so I'll let you yeah, do it. That sounds good. Hi, everybody. I'm Lonnie Hessen, and I am an occupational therapist um, here with our Phoenixia Foundation team. I am not going to be presenting this evening, but I will be answering your questions in the Q&A. So feel free to type questions, go ahead and do that in the Q&A. And I will be writing back to you as my colleagues, Rafi Garcia and Vanessa Ibanez. They do their thing. I'm very excited to hear them. So welcome, thank you for joining. And um, we'll look forward to your questions as we go along. Thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> um, 
please ask all the questions. Lonnie is a great resource and has all the answers. I go to her for all of my questions. Um, with that being said, I'm Rafi Garcia. I'm a occupational therapist at Lonnie's Clinic at Kids Space Therapy. And I have actually been to the Philippines with the Phoenixia Foundation. And I love all of you and I miss you. And I wish I can return back so sometime soon. Um, if you're out there and you make great lumpia, save some for me. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Rafi. So I am Vanessa Ibanez. I'm an occupational therapist from Davao City, Philippines, and I've been working with Phoenix. I've been volunteering with Phoenix for quite some time now. So I'm really excited to do this with, the, with them again. So, and I'm excited to know that many are teachers and parents. So we are all partners in the welfare of children with special needs. And I just want to make sure when you guys are seeing my screen, are you just seeing the presentation or are you also seeing the chat and the poll? I see the poll on mine. Let me see the poll. Okay, so you guys, but do you see the chat? I can going? turn it off. I can turn off my poll. My poll's off now. Yes. But are you guys with my screen? Are you just seeing? I just see the uh, PDF now, the presentation. Okay, perfect. That's what I wanted to make sure of. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. So with that, um, I will, you guys remind me to page forward and I'm going to go off the video. I'll let the, the focus be on uh, Rafi and Van, but uh, I'm here if you guys need me to come back on. All right. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're frozen. Nope. Oh, we're, we're good. good. Perfect. If we can go to the slide of becoming your child's play partner. Awesome, perfect. So I will start us off and hopefully I won't take too much time because I would love to hear Vanessa, she has a special presentation for you guys too along the lines of play. Um, so I wanna begin by saying I'd like to encourage families to revisit play as an important aspect of your child's um, childhood, whether they have a disability or don't have a disability. Um, you can briefly look up stuff online um, about how to apply the concepts of play, but this presentation will mostly be focused on understanding why you give a specific activity and to help you manage or understand your expectations, um, how play develops and to know when to consult a therapist, whether it's a physical therapist, speech therapist, occupational therapist or psychologist. Um, and so I actually found this um, quote from Vanessa and it's from Pablo Neruda, great poet, um, who said a child who does not play is not a child. And um, that quote cannot be, I mean, more true. Um, I, through my experience, um, a lot of the kids that I have seen come through the clinic. Um, one of my biggest questions and things that I see is, you know, how much do they play? Um, because I'm, you know, coming from uh, America, a lot of Emphasis has been placed now on academics and a lot of our kids are facing lots of pressure of being able to um, write or read or do all of these academic skills um, before they can actually do any of these play skills. Um, and play is actually so fundamental to who they are as a child, who to they will be as a teenager, to then who they will be as an adult. Um, so a lot of the times I spend a majority educating my families um, about how to incorporate play and what, you know, how important is play to their life. Um, so my point here is that um, play as an outcome of intervention and, and how play skills are often overlooked, not only by OTs myself, um, you know, I've, I'm guilty of doing this, um, but also families um, forget about play a lot. Um, so we're gonna divide play into five uh, segments, defining play, impact of play, development of play, play to learn, and then simply play. And I promise you I'll try to do this as quickly as I can so that we can get um, to Vanessa. We can go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, it's still loading for me over here. Um, perfect. Good. Um, so again, I'm just an occupational therapist and all my perspectives come as an occupational therapist um, and from my model of practice as a pediatric occupational therapist. Um, 
An OT in general would help you to maximize your performance and independence in your roles in your respective environments by identifying any hindering and so, um, any hindrances and supporting factors in the person's skills, expected and wanted occupations or tasks to perform, and then create a program that can help build your skills or restore your skills, um, modify the task or the environment so that the person can still participate and become, produ and become productive despite um, any presence of impairments in children with delays um, and things of that nature. Um, as pediatric OTs, we identify the reason why your kid cannot finish writing a task at school and then give you, um, give you individualized strategies, um, a program to help um, complete activities or tasks at school or even in the home. And then we use play a lot. Play is so fundamental, but we use it a lot as a means and as our vehicle or tool to achieve goals like improve your child's skills with its uh, gross motor, fine motor, or cognitive. And that can also be a goal for us too to even actually help them learn how to play, um, such as social skills groups. Um, so now if you, you know, if you have any concerns about your child's play, um, again, please reach out to an OT, speech, um, physical therapist, um, even your even your school teachers and ask them, you know, I have some concerns about my kids play, you know, what are your thoughts and recommendations? Um, because the earlier the inter intervention can be implemented, um, the faster they can grow and learn um, and catch up to their peers. We can go to the next slide now. All right. Um, we can go to the one after the circles, Lisa. The slide with play according to Takata. Oh, one more. One, sorry, did I jump ahead? Yeah, just one more. There? Yep, perfect, right there. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna define play. So it is a complex set of behaviors characterized by fun. Um, it involves sensory, neuromuscular, and mental processes. It involves repetition of experience, exploration, experimentation, and imitation. Monkey see, monkey do, classic game. Um, it proceeds within its own time and space boundaries. Um, so play is super present. Um, you're not thinking about you know, what's gonna happen in the future, um, but you are thinking about what's happening in the now and in the moment. Um, and play is the way the child learns what no one can teach him or her. It is the way they explore and orient themselves to the actual physical world of space and time of things, animals, structures, and people. Through play, our kids learn to live in our symbolic world of meanings and values of progressive striving for um, goals and at the same time exploring and experimenting and learning in their own individualized ways. Um, you know, play allows so much freedom to kind of explore who you are as a person, you know, who am I, Rafi, as I play? You know, am I Rafi the warrior? Or am I Rafi the soccer player? Or am I Rafi the astronaut? Um, these are all concepts that kind of help you think about, you know, who you think you want to be in the future. Um, it's, a, it's a great freedom to explore that. Um, through play, the child practices and rehearses endlessly the complicated and subtle patterns of human living and communication, which they must master if they are to become a participating adult in our social life um, as it functions as an agent for integrating the internal and external worlds and it follows a sequential development progression. Um, for OTs, play is simply the child's occupation. Um, our kids' jobs is to play, go to school, play sports if they have to, or if they have sports, um, you know, be a child in the family, uh, do chores, uh, maybe help out mom or dad in the shop. Our kids have jobs, but those jobs are different from adult jobs. Um, they have the more, more fun jobs, as, as I would put it. <laughs> um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, perfect. Um, impact of play, great. Showed up on mine now. Um, so impact of play is a purposeful activity with the result of mental and emotional experiences. Play is the vehicle for communication and growth of a child. Um, through play, our children learn skills, 
and develop interests that later affect life choices and success in work and leisure. And there's plenty of research to support um, that statement. Um, you know, thanks to the field of psychology, we can see that how much our kids play and how well they can interact with one another um, shows better outcomes in their adult life. Um, so if they have healthy relationships, um, you know, and are more or less and are joyful throughout their childhood and play a lot, they're gonna have more successful relationships with the people around them in their community as adults and have better jobs um, and job gratification as well. Um, play is the arena for the development of sensory integration, physical abilities, cognitive and language skills, and the one I can't stress enough, interpersonal relationships. Um, I can't stress that last one enough. At the core of being a human is social connection. Um, we wouldn't be humans if we did not seek or want to have social connections. So much of being a human is um, communicating and being friends and having parties and socializing with one another. I mean, that sounds like a lot of fun and I'm glad I'm a human. <laughs> um, in their play, children practice adult and cultural roles, learn rules and learn to become productive members of society. Um, a researcher by the name of Mary Riley, who is in our textbooks in occupational therapy, felt that play is a multidimensional system to adapt to the environment and that the exploratory drive of curiosity underlies play behavior. Um, this drive has three hierarchical stages, exploration, competency, and achievement. And so if you think about all the games that you play as a kid, you know, it all starts off with exploration, like, you know, what game are we going to play? Um, from there, you, you starts imagination, okay, let's play pirates, okay, how are we going to play pirates? Oh, we're going to pretend we have a ship. And then from there, um, we have achievement, okay, we have successfully completed a game of pirates. Those are the three hierarchies right there in a nutshell. Um, some of the examples developed through play are creativity, imagination, problem solving, building confidence, processing emotions, interacting with others, flexibility, and adaptability, and understanding situations, and a lot more. I mean, man, play is just so awesome, and it just gives the child so much ability to learn and grow. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I love play. <laughs> uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, oh, one back. Perfect, right there. Um, so kiddos or kids with physical and or cognitive impairments have difficulty playing, um, which can lead to behaviors such as self-stimulation or repetitive play. Um, you know, classic example of repetitive play is putting the lines or the cars in a single line or stacking up blocks, uh, but with no purpose, they just stay there. Um, limited repertoire of activities. So they only do maybe like two or three activities, but that's about it, you know, um, maybe that's their play. They have decreased social play and either increased or decreased fantasy play. Um, so there's two very extreme um, spectrums of play. It could either be, you know, no fantasy play or it could be so on the other side of, of play that you're just like, what are you talking about? We were first talking about, you know, pirates, but now we're talking about, you know, this whole other thing. Um, so it's trying to find that, that middle ground of a fantasy play that, you know, allows other kids to be able to engage with you. Um, a research paper by Bundy and other authors um, stated that although a child's play may not be typical, it was more important for children to be good at what they want to do. Um, and this is very important to understand, not only as therapists, but as parents and teachers, is to understand what the child with disabilities wants to do. Because if you can speak in their language, then you can understand them. And if you can understand them, you can help them access um, different areas of play. Um, and that's gonna motivate them to do so many more things, um, you know, and persevere for tasks. So if you can understand them and meet them to where they are in their language of play, you're gonna open lots of doors um, that will fascinate you and leave you, you know, leave you with your, with your jaw on the floor. Um, the child with a physical impairment may display limited movement, strength, and pain when performing daily activities. Um, the play characteristics of children with physical limitations or sensory issues may include fear of movement, decreased active play, and preferences for sedentary activities. 
Um, so our kiddos with physical limitations may not want to move so much because things may hurt or it's so hard for them that they would just rather lay down or stay seated or even just play on a tablet because um, that's a lot easier than moving around and chasing stuff. Um, the child may also have problems with manipulating toys and show decreased exploration. Additionally, children with physical impairments may have decreased opportunities for social play due to lots of hospital hospitalizations or routines that do not allow for social interaction. Um, children with cognitive impairment often show delayed social communication skills, gross fine motor skills, difficulty in emotion regulation. Um, this one is very hard for them because they can't um, express or tell you what they feel. So the only way that our kids with cognitive impairments can communicate is by, you know, throwing their hands up in the air or making sounds. Um, you know, they don't have the language to tell them, hey, I'm frustrated or, hey, I'm very upset. Um, and they also have a lack of sustained attention. Um, so their attention window is super short, but you can start to build on that, you know, through play, actually. Um, these characteristics may be manifested in play and preferences for structured play materials, limited or inflexible play repertoires, decreased curiosity, destructive or inappropriate use of objects. So they may just grab you know, a hairbrush, but instead of brushing their hair, they can use that hairbrush to, you know, break toys or break other things. Um, decreased imagination, decreased symbolic play, decreased social interaction, decreased language, and increased observer play. Um, so they may have a preference to just sit to the side and watch other kids play instead of engaging in play with their friends. Um, these kids may need more structure and external cues, um, you know, having teachers or parents kind of support their kid to play um, and develop their play skills, which is totally fine because they're learning, um, but they need that extra push to help them. Um, now our kids with visual impairments, um, they have difficulty in constructive play, delays in developing complex play routines with others and decreased imitative and role play. Um, so a game like monkey see monkey do would be very hard for them to do or Simon says, because they can't see their friend or they can't see their parent, um, you know, due to their visual impairments. Um, it's very challenging to play when your vision is impaired, but it doesn't mean that they can't play. They still can play. You just have to figure out how it is that you're going to play. Um, our children with a hearing impairment is believed to have problems with decreased inner language, decreased social interactions, and decreased understanding of abstract concepts. Um, Think of how much we use our ears to listen to our friends. You know, is there, is it a happy voice? Are they communicating in an angry voice or is it a joking voice? You know, if you have a hearing impairment, impairment it's very hard um, to understand what the other is saying. Um, again, these are manifested in play and that imagination becomes more restrictive um, with age and increased time is spent in non-interactive construction play. Um, so things that you might start to see as, as they get older, you know, they might have a decrease in friendships um, and might want to stay inside and not go play with others because it's just so hard for them to understand what their friends are saying. Um, children with hearing impairments demonstrate, you know, just decreased symbolic play and increased solitary plays I said earlier. Um, going back to last week's topic of sensory integration, um, our kiddos with sensory integration challenges often have a limited or distorted perception of themselves and of the world. Um, a decreased ability to plan and execute motor and cognitive tasks and poor organization of behavior. Um, so some of these play characteristics of these kids include either excessive movement or decreased um, movement or even avoiding movement, decreased exploration um, or even risky behavior. Um, so you have one kid that won't want to do a game or, you know, we don't have a kid not want to climb a tree or you'll have a kid want to climb everything around the house that it gives you a heart attack. Um, that's kind of the ways that sensory integration plays a role in play. Um, decreased gross motor manipulative play, increased observation or solitary play and increased sedentary. Again, kind of similar to um, physical limitations or cognitive impairments, um, our kiddos with sensory challenges uh, will oftentimes, you know, not engage with their friends. They would rather just stay on the outside and just watch their friends play. Um, our kids with, or kids with autism spectrum disorders, play is characterized by lack of inner and expressive language, um, stereotype movements or types of play, 
decreased imitation and imagination, lack of variety in play, uh, lack of variety of play in repertoires, motor planning problems, decreased play organization, decreased manipulation of toys, decreased construction and combination of objects, and decreased social play. Um, those are some of the you know, stereotypical behaviors we see on our, on our kiddos with autism spectrum disorders. And then some kiddos with cerebral palsy um, can show difficulty with gross and fine motor skills and cognitive skills. Um, but again, you have to figure out what your kids play languages, whether they have a disability or not. Um, but the more you understand their diagnosis, um, the better you're gonna be able to play with them and help them play. Next slide, please, Lisa. Play as a tool. Oh, perfect, thank you. So play offers a practical vehicle um, to enlist a child's attention, to practice specific motor and functional skills, and to promote sensory processing perceptual abilities and cognitive development. Um, play also serves to support social, emotional, and language development. Let me read that sentence again because it is very important um, if we want to be successful humans as adults. Play also serves to support social, emotional, and language development. Oh, one back, Lisa. Thank you, yep. So that is why it is used as a tool by occupational therapist, physical therapist, speech therapist and psychologist, despite the fact that the goal-oriented, externally controlled aspects of the therapy situation conflict with the essence of play itself. Play is very meaningful to the child. It is their language and we must speak it should we want to make a positive change in their life. Now we can go to the next stage or next slide. So just to review, oh, one more back. Yep, so just to review in short what we talked about Again, play is your child's primary occupation, play is a tool to equip children with skills, functional skills, and disability impacts play, but it doesn't mean that they can't play. You're just gonna have to find another way to play with your kid. Next slide. Perfect, so how does, oh, perfect. So how to, uh, one back. There we go, right there. So how does play develop? So first stage is unoccupied occupied play, which is from birth to three. So at this stage, um, to three months. So at this stage, baby is just making a lot of movements with their arms, legs, hands, and feet. They're learning about and discovering how their body moves. So they're gonna wiggle a lot. Um, they're, just gonna, they're just gonna move a lot. They're gonna be squirmy. Um, solitary play starts around two years. Um, this is the stage when a child plays alone, or not two years, but from birth until two, that's solitary play. Um, this is the stage when a child plays alone. So they're not interested in playing with others quite yet. Um, they may just do a lot of looking, but they're playing all alone. Um, onlooker play starts at two years and beyond. So that's when a child plays alongside or near others, but does not play with them. Um, and this stage is also known as parallel play. Um, so onlooker and parallel play kind of cross with one another. Um, so onlooker play is two years and plus again, when a child plays alongside or near others. Um, well, it's frozen, well, there we go. Um, it's when a child plays alongside or near others but does not play with them again. Um, that, that's onlooker and parallel play. And associative is from three to four years. Um, here your child plays with other children. Um, they play together, same toy in the same place, but with their own project. Um, so an activity would be painting. So everybody's painting but they're you know, painting on a big canvas um, or they're taking chalk and they're all on the sidewalk, you know, coloring or drawing things, uh, but they have their own project. Um, the kids not organize their play toward a common goal. So if they were all you know, drawing uh, fishes to make an ocean, that would be into social play, but social, associative play would be, you know, we're drawing letters and somebody's drawing fishes, um, but still using the chalk. Um, social play, is from four years and up. So here you see the beginning of teamwork. Your kids play with others for a common purpose. So we're either playing jump rope, we're playing tag, basketball, um, soccer. Those are some, some plays you can, they do at social play. Next slide. Thank you. Um, this is another sequence of developmental plays um, known as Takata stages of play. Um, 
So from zero to two, um, here's what you see our babies do. Um, again, they're um, peekaboo, um, hide and seek, um, imitation with caregivers, dropping objects. Um, again, they're still exploring how their body moves. Um, they're practicing new motor skills, simple problem solving. So they go from being seated and chewing on things um, to maybe having lunch time or tea time with their baby doll and feeding them spoonfuls. Um, symbolic and simple constructive play. Um, this is where you start to see make believe and pretend play. You know, uh, pretend you're an astronaut, pretend you're a fisherman, pretend you're a basketball player. Um, they experience they experience those represented in play. They shift from solitary play to parallel play, and they build on simple constructions that represent another object or situation, um, such as you know we're going to play house. Um, or, you know, what does it mean to play house? Okay, there's maybe mom, dad. And then we have, you know, we own a store together. We own a farm together. Um, that's where symbolic and simple constructive play. That's where, those are the skills you start to see. Um, and then you'll see a lot of climbing and a lot of running around, which means a lot of heart attacks and headaches for parents. Um, still on the part of symbolic play. Um, from about a year to a year and a half, in symbolic play, your child, is the initiate the initiating agent of the play actions so they pretend to drink from a cup um, during pretend snack time pretends to talk on play telephone brushes their own hair during play cleaning and dressing script um, from a year and a half to two years um, this is called passive other where your child acts on non-animated substitute toys such as putting a cup to a doll or teddy bear's mouth and pretends to have it drink puts telephone up to a doll or teddy bear's ear and pretends to have it talk on the phone or pretends to brush doll or teddy bear's hair. Um, that's another concept you'll see between year and a half and two years. Um, we can go on to the next slide. All right, dramatic, complex, constructive, and pregame. Um, from right here is where you, you'll see them laying out the dishes and doll for a pretend snack time and carrying out a sequence of theme related play acts pretending to build a house with play tools. Um, so between four years and seven years, you'll see their play just take a whole another dimension, um, you know, really taking on the role of um, playing house or, you know, having a tea party with, with their friends and dolls during this age. Um, that's where you see the difference between the four and seven and the year and a half and two years. Um, just that big difference in their imaginative play. And then from seven to 12, that's where the fascination with rules, um, their rules and really, you know, differentiating what is fair, what isn't fair. Um, that's, you'll see the expansion of social participation. Um, you'll see kids enacting on daily experiences, social roles and fairy tales and myths. Um, you know, right here, they're, they're daredevils um, during this time between seven and 12. Um, constructions are more realistic. There's a lot of humor um, and creative rhymes. Um, games with rules, um, mastering established rules and making up new rules, um, risk taking in games, um, concern with peer status. You know, do my friends like me? Do they not like me? Am I best friends with that person? Am I not best friends with that person? Um, your friendship groups are very important during this time. Um, you have an interest in sports informal groups, um, cooperative play, and interest, and interest in how things work, such as nature and crafts. We can go to the next slide. Um, so just to review, in that, um, again, play follows a developmental sequence. And the more you understand that sequence, the better understanding you'll have of your child's, well, the better understanding you'll have of your expectations and what to expect of your child and those um, in those ages, whether they have a disability or not. Um, so think about how you can identify your child's play skills and at what stage of play should your child be at. And if there's you know, questions, then again, ask your teachers, um, your OTs, your PTs, and your speech therapists. Um, ask all the questions, we're here to help you. Next slide. Um, good morning. This is my part now. Um, Lisa, can you go back one slide? Okay, thank you. So for this section, thank you. 
Thank you, Rafi. I'll see you in a while. We'll see you in a while. <laughs> okay, so um, you have identified the importance of play, the impact of play, and the developmental sequence of play. So now for this session, we hope that this will help you take advantage of your child's play as a teaching opportunity because I'm sure you are interested in how to maximize play as you know, a tool to help your kids learn skills. So because we've already established that play can be a powerful tool to teach your child skills because it is meaningful for them. So um, it's nice if we can, we can um, learn about these principles. Um, infants and toddlers are experiential and hands-on learners. So they need to feel and experience a toy. It is rare to see a child that, you know, that just, they just look at the toy, right? So they often go for it, touch it, throw it, or even lick it, which is a nightmare for parents, okay? So, and then just try how it works. And then relationship with adults have significant influence on learning through imitation. Like we see children imitate cooking. As they can see adults in the kitchen cooking. Peekaboo, peekaboo game because you did peekaboo game before with them. Or seeing your child feed, clean up, and bring their doll to sleep because your kid had experienced your tender loving care. And that is a positive experience that your child is trying to recreate during play. And also, it is important to have a routine, you know, um, routine of activities at home, or maybe we can just put it as a predictable pattern of doing things. So, for example, um, children will learn, like, after meals, they, you clean them up and then bring them to toilet for toilet trips for training. Eventually, that child learns that pattern and initiate cleanup after a meal and maybe attempt to go to the toilet, just like what you did in, the, in his daily schedule. So also children learn from visual auditory field information. That's why children can help, can help it, but get and manipulate a new object, explore its, all its sensory features and integrate those information in their brain. And then very important is that this one, um, skills are just beyond. So after, uh, after mastering a skill, a child may be ready to learn a new one or be challenged. So if your child's skill is still at the emerging level, so it's still emerging, like he can wear pants, but um, sometimes he'd cry because he finds it too challenging. So we better work on the mastery of that skill first before considering teaching him another skill or moving forward. So that's why we presented the developmental sequence of play earlier is that for you to understand where your child is, set realistic expectations, and also gauge where your child's skills levels are at. So we don't like to expect children not to, like example, pretend them to play cooking and then serve after when this child is not yet able to use the toy ladle to steer on the pot. So it means this, this child doesn't really understand yet the use of that tool. So how can you actually pre expect him to do pretend play? So actually, your, the play level of your child reflects a lot on the child's cognitive skills, um, enrichment of concepts, and basically his skill levels. Next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. So these are prerequisite skills to have a meaningful social interaction, isn't it? That we want our child to be able to interact with us so that your child can maximize the learning opportunities at school and maybe, and school and um, learning opportunities with other children because we all know that children also learn from other children, but without effective or without um, efficient ability to socially interact with others, they might not benefit from that kind of interaction. Like for example, if your child is not yet engaged and then you're assuming that enrolling that child to a play school will actually improve the social interaction of the child. Maybe, but maybe not because if the child's skills are not ready, these prerequisite skills are not yet ready, 
your child is just wasting his time in the play school. So, and um, yeah, so because of maybe at presence of a diagnosis, these skills, these skills uh, listed here may be, may not be present or may have delays or may be inconsistently present. So um, it's important to have that they have the face recognition and then there is this eye gaze or our ability to demonstrate a steady look and then emotional, I'm sorry, and then joint attention. So what is joint attention? Joint attention is a shared attention on an object. This happens when an individual alerts another to an object by means of eye gazing or pointing or um, basically allowing us to follow someone's lead on what it's what he or she is looking at. So this is an exact. This is an illustration of a joint attention that both child and parent, a mother is looking at the same, are looking at the same object. Okay. Next is um. So these are, which is very important, a very important prerequisite skill in social interaction. And um. Next is uh, emotion perception. And then next is biological motion. So biological motion is our ability to identify and understand familiar actions that is integral in social interaction. So basically, what is it for? So it is helpful in predicting, predicting what will people do in the future. So uh, children is in general would be interested when other people or children move and can recognize human movement. Children would also likely to observe actions that they have experienced before. So this concept is particularly important in imitation and identifying what to observe. Like a child who plays with cops and crawls would likely to watch another child playing with a cop and who is crawling and observe how the other child is playing with the cop differently which in turn can, which in turn he would imitate that child. So this is helpful in terms of, you know, allowing us to observe others moving and learn from them and then multiplying our own experiences and knowledge for successful, successful movement strategies. So this, is, this can also be helpful in, or useful in understanding how our action will end up example <clears throat> a child standing who may be leaning towards the left side to get a toy and another child who is five years old seeing this would most likely run faster to the direction of the toy that he also likes because he knows by just the other child leaning towards the left would likely to go for the toy that he also likes but he wants it to get it for himself so he would try to run faster because that child was able to predict now oh we wanted the same toy by just reading the body movements yeah. so those are important okay and then understanding others actions so next slide please okay so now you must have read that our ability to learn is a brain activity a brain process. So learning can be affected when the brain is changed by these factors. So these are all based on research. So expo exposure to neurotoxins, so our, our ability to learn might change because the structure of the brain might be changed because of these neurotoxins. And then uh, important for the next two points is that is that experience of the child matters. That is why we have a lot of early start program. We have a lot of early intervention. These programs did not just, you know, sprout just to dig holes in our pockets. These, are, these services were, were there because of the recent research. Okay, for the third point, the brain developed neural networks based on our ongoing behavior, that, they, that these networks that support and enhance response patterns to frequently frequently encountered stimuli. So for example, if you let your child play with a car turned over and repeatedly turn the wheels instead of how should a car run, um, not corrected, this will be his idea of playing the car. 
So we have to alter that experience so that he will learn the proper way. Next slide. Thank you. Um, okay. So experience of reward and feedback from the environment is an integral integral part of this process. So it's important that we, yeah, we give them correction, we approve what they're doing right. And then um, infancy is marked with brain, with marked brain plasticity. So based on research, uh, the most rapid time when the brain is developing is up to six years old. So that's why, again, a lot of early intervention, a lot of Head Start programs. And then intervention experiences will contribute to brain changes. Of course, us intervening on how the child play and correct them will, will um, improve this child's skills. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Think about what, what your child, what you want your child to be able to do in the following areas. So these are actually the areas of development. Okay, so uh, about, uh, in these areas, you have component skills, like for example, play. In, in the context of play, in the area of play, you want your child to be able to, to demonstrate the use of tools, like a hammer should not be a mounting piece, but it should be, it should be pounding a pretend nail. Or a ladle, it's, it's supposed to steer on the pot, and it's not for hitting objects. So, something like that. So let us say uh, I have a kid, I have a child who is three years old um, who does not respond to name calling and likes to play with toy cars only and because of that would not engage to me as the parent. As a result, the cry the, my child cries a lot in protest. Um, it's hard to teach him skills and would avoid interaction with me. And um, when he wants something, he would either hand lead or just cry, which is which often leaves me guessing what he wanted. So we don't actually, as parents, it's easier if the child can actually tell us what they want, right? So as for my child, my goal, my goal now is I want him to communicate what he wants. So I would choose communication in this area. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. As for my child, I want him to I want him to communicate what he wants. So when you want to change a child's behavior, it is important that um, you can identify the skill, what you want to improve. You have to be able to name it, label it, and identify it specifically. Um, having a goal that I want my child to behave, I want him to talk, are not actually help, helpful in terms of goal setting. So you have to specify. So for example, the skill that I wanted my child to learn is I want him to communicate what he wanted without crying. Okay? And then my antecedent, the antecedent is what will I use to elicit the behavior? So for example, when do I want him to communicate? So it's like, for me, my antecedent would be when I ask him, what do you want? So when I ask him, what do you want? So usually, you know, children who can, cannot communicate, what they wanted would like just shout or would do hand leading. So that's my cue now that my child wants to communicate and then maybe cry. You know, you just, he suddenly cried and you, you're confused what, what your child wants. So what will I do when I see that? I will ask him, what do you want? So that's my antecedent because that's the cue for my child that, you know, I want you to tell me what you want. So that's the antecedent. And then the behavior that I want, what, I, what do I want my child to be able to do? Okay, what do I want to observe? Do I want my child to cry or do I want my child to just hand lead? Maybe um, let's change the hand leading. So maybe I want my child to point and say, maybe not really not the exact words because I know my child is having difficulty. For example, I want car, so he can say car. At least car, it sounds like, you know, word approximation. Or even without the words, just maybe point without crying. Pointing is actually communicative in nature. So without crying, even, um, so yon. And then um, 
Next is mastery. So what do I mean by mastery? I want to see it all the time. I wanted to see it consistently with me as a parent. Next is the generalization criteria. What does it mean? So it's like he will demonstrate that pointing even outside our home and even with the grandmother, the teacher at school, and the brother. So it's like usually children, when you they have the tendency to demonstrate an expected behavior when uh, to the person teaching him so when it's not me who's you know facilitating the skill or the the appropriate you know i want you to point and not cry it's usually with me only but with other people he will not demonstrate the same thing okay so i want i want that skill generalized to other setting outside our home and i want him to generalize that behavior with other people also Okay. Then after that, next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. After that, you have to break down that skill into five steps, maybe five little steps that is easier to accomplish. This will help you um, prevent frustration, you know, or feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry for your child. So this is an example, another example, but... Um, if you ask me about the skill that we, we talked about earlier, so my first step will be, my number one step here, is the easiest to accomplish. For example, if I want my child to request, communicate, so maybe I want him to do palm up because he cannot communicate yet, and point, or palm up, point, So and then look at me. So when he does that, he, I want three things. Looking at me, pointing, and showing me palm up to communicate na I want, I want that toy. So, so that those are three things happening at the same time. And maybe that's going to be difficult for you to accomplish or for your child to be able to, you know, learn in a month. So what I want is just for my child to do, like, I gaze first. Like, you want something, look at me. Or you want something, maybe looking at another person is very difficult and your child really avoids that. Maybe just show me palm up gesture and stand in front of me. So that's my step one. And then um, maybe given two choices because your child is unable to retrieve first in his mind, na, ah, I want this and that. He can't label yet. So given two choices, you present him two choices, um, he can actually maybe look at you and look at the choice. Or point or maybe reach for it so yeah or put his palm up hand near the choice that he wanted so and then so that could be my step one and then my step two could be um i want my child to establish eye gaze show uh show palm up gesture to request and point to the choice given to given two options so i want all three things for my second goal like second step i want all three things observe so i will not give him his choice unless i see all those three things okay and then number three combine eye contact palm up gesture to request and point to the object given three options so that's more difficult because he has more choices and it's more difficult to really specify which one in terms of pointing and then number four could be combine eye contact palm of gesture to request or point to the object without presented options without objects presented but within the same room so you're not giving him choices but you know what he wants is inside the room so it's important that you know your child most likely you know the cry that they want the the cry that they the tone of the cry or their actions their body language you can most likely tell what they wanted so you can use that to your advantage okay and then number five combine eye contact palm up gesture to request and point on the object of choice without presented options but in the same room at home at school with two or more people so other than the mother so for example you wanted him to demonstrate the same at school also or at home or maybe in the mall and uh, maybe more than uh, other than you you want him to demonstrate the same behavior when 
he is with the grandmother or with the teacher. Next slide, please. Okay. So, this is how now you start it. So, after you set your goal, it's important that you set your goal. You, If you want to teach your child, again, you should be clear with what you want your child to learn. So, you have to set it. Then, let's proceed. After you set your goal, number one is the, um, every conversation starts with a good listening. So, identify what motivates your child. So, how do you do that? You observe your child. You can even write it down, make a list, what he wants and what he doesn't like. Some parents, you know, um, they forget to do this. So, this is very important. Now, you list it down. So that it's easier for you to, you know, plan out what you want, what to use, okay? And then when he plays or holds a toy, you can actually join him first by not giving any demands. It's like, you know, just enjoy that moment with him so that your child can equate your presence as a positive and not imposing. So, you know, if he's playing cards, he's making, he's uh, setting, making a tower, you know, it's aimless right now. But, you know, you try to, you try to be there. Oh, can I play with you? Can I join? Can I watch you? Oh, you're making a tower. Oh, that's a long tower. And then probably that the tower collapsed already and then he will do it again. So, it's a repetitive pattern that you actually don't like. But, you wanted to use that opportunity next time to, to be as a teaching opportunity. So right now, you know, just try to join him and, you know, make your presence as a happy presence and not an imposing presence yet. Okay. And then show interest, like nods approval. Oh, I like your tower. It looks very nice. And then, um, okay, when he puts up the, the uh, when he brings a block up okay oh you did it good job something like that so and then you just smile you know your smile is a sight for your children okay and then comments on what he's doing okay are you oh you put the block up but again keep your distance so not too close that you're going to touch him you know respect the, the his play space first and then or you can also say, like, for my child who likes to turn wheels, no? Um, you can say, oh, you're turning the car. Oh, you're turning the wheel. That makes you happy, right? So you're actually acknowledging his happiness or what he wanted to do with the car. But again, keep your distance. Um, read your child's language. Like, if he turns away from you, you can always comment, Oh, you're not ready to play with mommy yet. Okay, I'll wait for a little while. I'll stay here. So, so you can like keep your distance. But you comment on it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. Then you can draw your child's attention. You know, you, you can eliminate the competition. You can start now setting your play space. You can take center stage, like position in front of your child. And then you can watch and comment and be helpful. So let's go back to, okay, let's go back to, to your child who likes to turn the wheels. Okay, you can actually, you can actually set up the, the play area wherein you limit the choices of toys. Like you can just put another toy that he doesn't like and then another toy, like a toy car that he really, he really is motivated to play. So then most likely you will choose the car, right? So then he turns the car over and then turn the wheel. And then you can comment, oh, you're turning the wheel. Let me see. Can I turn the wheel too? So you're trying to take turn. You're trying to take turns with your child. He did it. And then you try to like imitate him and do it with him with the same car. Or if it doesn't allow you, you can have another car with you and try to imitate in front of him. Like position yourself in front of him while he can, he can see you. So make sure that you are at eye level with your child. Or you can, you know, it's when your child is very young, like three years old, it's going to hurt your back because you have to like lean forward, bend, and then, you know, just make sure that you have that eye, same eye level with your child. Okay. So, yeah. 
Or you can be helpful, like he wants to line up blocks. This is common. They like to line up blocks. So go ahead and help him line up the blocks. Or you can just, you know, um, make available a few blocks and then the rest of the blocks are in a container. So I'm sure he wanted more than two blocks. He wanted all the blocks by himself. So you but you have the want him to communicate. So you you withhold the other block. So then he ha he has no other choice but to go to you and ask for the block. So this is now your chance to, you know, uh, you do you want the blocks or do you want? What do you like? For example, um diba my antecedent, I decided my antecedent. What do you want? So most likely you're only holding one toy. So it's most likely it's the blocks and there are no other toys available. So then um, you can you can actually facilitate, okay, palm up, I want, and then point to what you're holding. So point to the block. Okay. So that is an opportunity already for you. You're already you're respecting the way he plays and joining him, but you're already maximizing that opportunity to teach him how to communicate by pointing and doing fun up gesture. Okay. Or um, you can change, like if you want him to say open and then eventually change that. You still have the same activity, but this time you want him to say open. Okay. Or you want him to say give. So, uh, you just have to have that clear goal in mind. So don't mix your goals. Like, oh, okay, I will just change. Just stick with it. If you decided to, you, know, you want him to point and show palm up, just stick to that. Don't change like, ah, okay, I want him to say open now. So maybe next next me next time okay I just make sure that, now it changed uh, to play by himself so join him imitate him or add some variation so like for example again if he likes to turn the car and turn the wheels maybe you can pretend you have another car with you and then he's all he's doing is you know turn my car and then turn the wheels and then you have your other car as a parent oh you're, you're showing him you're showing him now how to how to wheel the car properly around. So you can now pretend, the variation is now, you can now pretend that, oh, we are on a race. So, for example, in a race car, in a race event, racing event, one lap, two laps, three laps, or after maybe four laps, they need to stop and change the tire. So you can use that concept. Okay, I, I'm done. Oh my. And then imitate him. Pretend that that turning, turning the car over and then turning the wheels is changing the car. And then you can comment, oh, your car needs, your tires needs changing too. Okay, let's change. So you, you turn that, you turn that wheels for him. So that's an example of a variation that you can actually add in his game. And then after that, okay, we're done changing cars. Okay, now let's try to take the lap. So maybe you can assist him physically, assist his hand to turn the car properly. And then together you can take the lap, one circle. And oh, our tires are broken again. Let's try to change it again. So it's like you're combining already the, you know, I like he likes to turn the car over and, and just turn the wheels. So, but you can actually use that as a play activity and then eventually after he realized no it's more fun to like you know wheel the car away to somewhere he will imitate you and it's i've tested that many times and it usually works we were able to remove that you know just turn the car and just turn the wheels okay and then for the next slide okay so be more active no okay so you can Yes, you can take cues on your child's lead, but you can actually control the choices. So when you decide, okay, I'm going to use this playtime, his playtime now as a teaching opportunity. Like maybe in his routine, 
he like he you just leave him play for four hours because you're busy with your other children or you have to do all other housework or you have work at home but you have to set aside a time okay 10 minutes of his play time i'm gonna use that as a play to learn session so at this time you can control the choices of toys limit the choices with two like put up the toys that's most interesting for him and then the others keep it away so that he has no choice but to go to you and another toy that he will not really choose no so but the toy that you're gonna put out that it's interesting for him could be a toy that you can use easily for teaching so for example um your your like for example, he likes cars, but when he he doesn't see cars, he likes to play with blocks. Now you want to teach him how to match, so it's easy to teach matching using blocks, right? Like matching colors. So for example, that's your other goal. So you want him to match colors. So you can put out the blocks and another toy that he will not choose ever. So he will decide, you know, I will not play anymore if I see that toy. And then, um. You can you can actually use that as uh, because he has no other choice. I like I like the blocks better than the other one. So you already planned what you're gonna do with the blocks, how to match. Okay. So again, the tendency is you will line up the, the blocks and then maybe what you can do now is you have another set and then you start matching. Okay, I'm gonna help you. Maybe he will remove that. And then maybe you can just follow the pattern and then label, okay, oh you're putting on the red, putting the red block or the green block okay oh i already help you help you make a line make a line so maybe you you help me make mine so something like that and then make another line that is matching to his block train or blocks lines so yeah okay and then uh, for the next slide okay so with those tips given, you're actually building a joint activity routine with your child. So you taking turns, sharing materials, looking at each other, communicating, and building on each other's idea. So isn't it when you imitate him and try to introduce some pretend play with him in his like turning wheels play, that is already building on his ideas like he's turning it or oh, then then you come up with oh or maybe we can just pretend that we're changing tires and fixing the tires so like like that you you label that turning of wheels which is like aimless and non-purposeful into something purposeful and then of course it's not just play that he is free to do whatever he wants you're actually facilitating an activity that is energetic expecting effort providing him hands-on experience in, in an organized and goal-directed and not just aimless, continuous turning of wheels. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so there are two types in a build, building joining joint activity routine. So the first one, the, the example that I was talking about is actually a boys, an object-based joint activity wherein you have you have parallel objects you have you have parallel objects uh parallel actions with objects so you like um you have he has one car and then he you have another one and then you're trying to imitate him and then you keep on commenting and maybe you know you may you may say to yourself that uh, i keep on talking he's not responding so don't worry, your, your interaction with him will be eventually reciprocated if you continue to, you know, be with him in his play, okay? And then shared attention to objects, like for example, you, you don't have another car, but he's playing with another car. You know, you're trying to be interested with what he's playing. And then taking turns. Okay, the other one is the partner focus so when there is no other toys so it's like you're just using your face your body your voice your body your body movements and gesture so just like when you're singing action songs with your child this is the time when you can give him more sensory experiences like um if the child responds well with movement and would not sit down and sit still you know he likes to move around 
And this can be used to be connected with him. So for example, uh, mostly kids likes to sing Wheels of the Bus. So you can sing Wheels of the Bus go round and round, but instead of Wheels of the Bus go round and round doing this arm circling movement, you can actually carry him and Wheels of the Bus go round and round, and then you turn him. So you give that re rotationary movement and that is actually, that will be helpful in terms of, you know, engaging, looking at you. And then after the round and round, maybe taking two rounds because the word round and round is twice in the song. So turn around and then stop. And then wait for him to look at you first before proceeding to the next line. So you're actually having that, you're actually achieving that goal or trying to get that goal. Now, I want him to look at me when he wants something. So by just singing song, Wheels of the Bus. Okay. So don't go, don't go on the next slide. Don't sing the next lines if he doesn't look at you. You can actually from, oh, look at me first. You want more? You want more song? Let's, you want us to sing more? Okay, maybe you can move his head. Okay, you're looking at me. Oh, you want more? Okay. All the wheels of the bus go around and round. And then stop again. Wait for him to look at you. You want more? Something like that. So then you connect with him. And then next. So to help you. Next slide, please. Thank you. To help you progress with the step. Because I was like demonstrating it and giving you tips. So let's put it in a more structured way. So uh, uh, think about what your goals are. And then um, think about the joint activity routine with four stages. So these are the four stages. So maybe your goal could be playing with an object, sharing, giving, pointing, commenting. So for the first one, the setup. Setup is not the setup of the physical environment. The setup is actually the first toy that your child touches. So like if he chose car, he touched the car, that is your setup. It's the car, okay? So you can start by commenting and pointing at the same time. Oh, you took a car. Is that a blue car you're holding? So you know, start to comment, okay? And then point at the same time because you want him to point. So then model, it, model the behavior. Then this is the time you can actually give him opportunities for him to ask from you. Maybe he got one car. Okay, you take the other cars. And if he still wants more, then... And now you can just choose like one opportunity or two opportunities. After that, you can give it, give it away because you, you might spoil the moment if you give too much demand, okay? And then, uh, so by just, by just uh, letting him get the car from you, you're actually working on the approach request goal. Now, if he's not ready to ask yet and decide to turn away from you, maybe wait for the next move, okay? And try again. Or maybe offer him the car and your demand now is for him to just look at you. Maybe not point yet. So you're trying to grade down your expectation. Okay. And then, um, next slide. Okay. The next one is the... Sorry. Okay. Um, next slide again, please. Okay. Okay, the next one, the next step is the theme. Okay, example, um, the, the toy car. He got the toy car. So that's your setup now. After getting it, maybe he walked around the room and started to wheel the car on the wall. So he started to wheel the car on the wall. So that is now your theme. Ah, okay, we're going to use this car as a, you know, we will wheel it towards the wall. So that's the theme now. Now you can think of what your goals now to work on. So maybe I, maybe one of my goals will be imitation. So I would like to work on imitation. So I will imitate him. So he, since he wheeled the car on the wall, I will imitate him and go whichever direction he leads me. But still, again, trying to label what we're doing 
and where we're going. Oh, we're going up. Okay, you're going up. Okay, I'll go with you. We're go I'm going up also. And then by doing that, you're you're already labeling what he's doing. You're you're actually enriching already his vocabulary. You know, you're trying to label whatever he's doing. You're you're trying to to imitate him. Yeah. And then after that, next slide, please. The next step is the variation. Okay, in the variation, okay, in the variation, you slowly introduce the change. So for example, uh like from the team, now you are imitating him and just go with the flow, with his flow, whatever he's doing. In variation, you're trying, you're trying now to introduce by bringing the car somewhere or other than just aimless riding the car up the wall. So tendency is just, you know, repeated up, up, up. That's aimless. That's not goal directed or goal oriented. So now in the variation step, you can actually try to introduce like for example you set up another block a block and then okay let's go to the airport so you change direction now and maybe you can prompt him to go with you oh can you go with me let's bring auntie auntie vanessa to the airport something like that okay so most likely if you're imitating him he will also try to go with you maybe for two seconds or three seconds you know just quick be quick you know face oops anticipate that he will veer away from you and then just assist him to keep going not really restraining just gentle physical prompt that you know go with me come with me okay and then um so something like that like or you can actually set up blocks that you will collide with the car or maybe a tower that you built earlier then pretend that's a building and then the car hit the building so that's going to be more fun, you know, the, the, the sound of the collapsing blocks. For some kids, that's music to their ears. And you can, you can maximize that experience as a positive experience. Okay. Then um, if you wanted to do it again, like you can see that, oh, I, he wants to hit the, the blocks with his car. Maybe you can build another block. Okay. Oh, okay. So you want to, let's make another tower. Or oh, this is the time that you can actually label the, ta the colors of the blocks or you can take turns with him. Okay, or oh, you put on the first block. Okay, now my turn, my turn. You can stop him for like, you're actually working on waiting, waiting skills or turn taking skills. Okay, my turn, I'll put the next block and then, okay, you can move on your, you can, you can put on your block. Something. And then, okay, are we ready? Let's hit the tower with the, with the car. Boom! So you can actually, you know, intensify the sound and then establish eye contact with him. So, yeah. And then if he wants to build another tower, maybe you can get the blocks and he needs to show you palm up gesture and point to get all the blocks back so we can we can also build again. So there. So it's just, you have to be sensitive where you're going to insert your goals in the variation stage. Now, from the setup team into the variation, that might like take a minute, a minute or maybe less than. Your chance is blown if you're not that sensitive. So it's nice before you start this, you observe your child very well when he's playing. Okay. Next is um, closing and transition. So um, he has to know when the activity is ending, okay? Or you can take a cue, like if he walks away, you know, he left the block and the cars. So that means he's finished. Okay, then you can declare all done, we are finished, and then try to pack away with him. Okay, let's pack away. Let's get another toy. Now, sometimes what you will get, oh, he does, he's not ready for that to pack away. He wants to play again. Okay, we are done. You already left. Okay, let's get another car. We are finished with this. So he has to finish. Like it's end, it has ended. Okay, so um, uh, you don't want any repetition, right? Because that's aimless. So at this time, you're teaching him, okay, we are done with this. We have to transition to another. Okay. So sometimes they will cry, something, you know, just wait it out. 
help them regulate by waiting for them. Okay. Then you can encourage your child to choose another toy. And then you're back at square one, back to step to, to set up. And you are at stage one again with a new toy. Okay. So for our summary, next slide, please. Okay. So, you know, in Play to Learn, play is led by the child. You're just joining him. You're just using that opportunity to teach him. Always use language, like when you comment, when you tell him, oh, you're doing this, you're holding this. Uh, I mean, not this. I mean, you're holding the car. You're holding the blue car. Oh, you're putting up the blocks, making a tower. So when you do that, you're using language, and then you're actually using use uh, enriching his vocabulary. And for the speech therapist, they call it info talk. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard of that. Okay, and then the adult makes it interesting and reciprocal through turn-taking, imitating the child's action, and adding interesting effects to sustain the child's attention and motivation for the objects and the actions. Okay, and then it's our role now as adults to elaborate the activity with the theme and the variation so that the child doesn't just repeat, like, they're, like it's like they're playing in circles. And it's meaningless, it's aimless, it's not really goal-oriented. So it's your role now to elaborate it, like expand it by maximizing the theme and the variation stage in the play. Okay. And then the adult weaves in target vocabulary, nouns, verbs, preposition, whatever language uh, teaching you want and then stimulate your child's imitation because imitation is very important in you know learn in the teaching learning process and then uh, develop symbolic aspects of play because um, it's not just about you know using that like cooking tools using the kitchen equipment they have to like progress from maybe steering to serving and then pretend to eat and then after that do the dishes so there should be a like a transition of scenes in the aspects of pretend play because we don't we don't just like steer all the time right okay and then uh, maintains maintains the activity as a didactic and reciprocal social activity so that's how you that's how you use play as a teaching opportunity and Rafi will uh, help us with the next aspect of play. It's called Simply Play. All righty, thank you, Vanessa. Lots of great information. Um, lots of great reminders for me too, as a therapist to carry over into my next sessions, especially um, during these times. Um, so thank you, Vanessa, a lot of great stuff. Um, so how to simply play with your kid. So as, as we discuss the stages, you want to determine where your child is, um, you know, in what stage they're in and meet them at that level. Um, again, the quicker you can speak your child's language, the faster they'll be able to develop those play skills and the more you can start to incorporate those other um, uh, higher skills that they need to achieve. Um, wait for your child's lead. If you try to push too much, you're gonna get a lot of resistance from your kid. Uh, be patient, um, let them direct you. And then if you have an idea, you know, try to find a way to incorporate it without disrupting play. Um, set time aside for his or her routine for genuine playtime. Um, you know, actually set, you know, whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes, you know, spend some time together actually playing with one another. Um, and you're going to see just a lot of, you're going to see some skills that you've never seen before from your kid. Um, they may surprise you. There's going to be a lot of happy moments. There's going to be maybe some frustrating moments. Um, but overall, it will be a great experience, not only for your kid, but for you as well. Um, make time to be your child's play partner. Um, I mean, our kids look so much to us, uh, especially with our world today and how we're so busy. Um, having mom and dad or grandpa, grandma being there, um, and spending that family time to play with one another is such a valuable time spent together. Um, I'm very big on family. Um, I, didn't grow, I didn't grow up with my grandparents around, so I spent a lot of time playing with my mom and dad, but I do wish I had my grandparents around so I could play 
a lot more with them because I know they have a lot of great stories and a lot of great ideas um, seeing them now uh, talk about play stuff. Um, they're, they're great. So again, make time to be your, your kid's play partner. Um, no intention of using play to teach other skills. Ex um, expect to let him play. So again, what this means is, you know, don't have your own agenda during this playtime. Um, let your child just play and explore play. Um, you know, you may have a plan A, B, or C, but you know, sometimes your plan doesn't go the way you want it to be, and that's okay. Your kids have different plans, and oftentimes, um, in my sessions, I know this: our kids' plans are a lot better, and I just find ways to trickle in skills, and it actually turns out a lot better. So, being you know, co uh, co kids or co therapists or co players is a great is a great way. Next slide. Um, so during this age, on unoccupied play stage, so again, from birth to about three, um, as you can see, the babies are just teething. They're just learning how to move their bodies. They're just playing with anything they can and learning, you know, what sounds this makes, um, how does this taste? Um, you know, they're putting things in their mouth. That's just their time to kind of learn how to, you know, navigate what are, what are these hands are for? You know, what are, what are these feet? Um, what's this object? Um, so yeah, just let them play. Next slide. Um, solitary, solitary independent play. Again, this is um, still from birth to about two years. It's okay to just let them play by themselves. Um, you can play alongside with them, um, but most often they probably won't even want to play with you. They just have their own ideas at this time. Um, so again, it's okay to let them explore how to play. Um, you can't bond. You can't bond properly to new people if you aren't comfortable being by yourself. Um, so during this time, if you see your kiddos being too attached, um, that might be a time to talk to a therapist or a teacher and see, you know, maybe there's someone in the area that can kind of help you, you know, why is my kid so attached to me? Because it could be some, um, you know, some things that your therapist might need to, to find and tease out. Um, but playing alone is a great way to develop those kind of independent skills. Next slide. Onlooker play. So this is when your kid, um, spends most of their time seeing other people play. Um, they're still playing in the realm, but they're doing, they're, you know, they're spending a lot of time observing. Um, and during this observation or onlooker play, what's actually happening is um, their mirror neurons in their brain is actually encoding or ingraining movements and ideas that they're seeing from other kids. Um, so it's a theory that was proposed a while back ago. And what we have, what research has shown is, you know, kiddos on the autism spectrum, um, don't have a lot of mirror neurons that are firing, which is why they don't imitate what their, what their kids do or what their peers do. Um, so during this time, um, they're just watching and it's building their ideas of what they can later on do to play. Next slide. Parallel play. Um, so here we see two kids um, playing near each other, but they're not playing with each other. So this is what par parallel play is. And this happens from about two to four years. Um, they're playing alongside, but they're not playing with each other. So they have their own ideas, they have their own um, mission to do, um, but they're still playing alongside. And um, you know, another great way to develop their own social skills and maybe some turn taking can happen here. Like, hey, are you using that toy? Nope, okay, can I play with it? Um, so this is kind of where par parallel play happens. Next slide. So sort of play. So if you think back to what I discussed earlier, um, you know, they're using the same tools, but they have different, um, different goals. So on the left-hand side, you see two kids playing with um, uh, sand shovels and buckets. Um, so they're playing together with those, but they're not building a castle together. They maybe have their own idea of what to do with that. And on the right-hand side, you see kids painting. Um, as you can see, it's very abstract. There's no, you know, we're not going to paint the Mona Lisa. They're just painting together. That's what associative play is. And again, that's from about four to about six, five, six years. Next slide. Cooperative play. This is around six and seven and beyond. So this is where you know they start to play together and work together. This is where the concept of being a team happens. Um, so you know, on the left hand side, you see the classic game of tug of war. All those kids are working together to pull the other person on the right hand side. You see maybe two brothers, you know, painting together. Um, looks like they're painting, I don't know, some trees and leaves. 
but their goal right here is to get mom dirty with paint. Next slide. And again, to overview, um, determine your child's play level, speak their language, start from there and have fun. So learn your kid's language. And then from there, just start to expand their play, be patient, let them lead. Um, and then, you know, if all else fails, just be in the moment with them and just breathe in, relax. Remember, we are humans too. We're not perfect. We're all trying to figure out how to play and play just happens naturally and you can't force it. Next slide. Boom. Thank you for being with us. Um, give yourselves a round of applause. Give yourself a hug. Drink some water. Um, thank you for being again with us, guys. Thank you very much. I miss the Philippines, as I said before. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, people who attended from the Philippines, which was super exciting. I just want to reach out and say I am so sorry for all of you who tried to get on Zoom and was not able to. We had purchased so that we could have over 3,000 attendees via Zoom and something happened and it stopped us at 500. So those of you who have joined us on Facebook Live, we are so glad that you were able to get there. Those of you who are watching the replay, um, we deeply apologize, but we will hopefully have this resolved by next um, week. Um, and you know, any friends or family members that tried to get in and you guys are on here, please let them know our deepest apologies. Um, but again, we will make sure that the link gets out to everybody who registered. Um, they would be able to find this on Facebook Live. And um, we look forward to seeing you all next week. And with that, we're going to make it a wrap. Have a great evening and a great afternoon, everyone. And Lonnie's back. Lonnie, would you like to say anything else? I, I know we just have wanted to questions. say thank you and good night. And any unanswered questions that remain, we will answer those and get uh, promised resources out to you. Um, we've taken account uh, a very good and timely topic um, that maybe we will try to round up on as a team. Um, there are lots of requests for how to play with your kids, um, especially if you're a teacher or a therapist, uh, utilizing telehealth uh, as we go forward in this time of shelter in place. Um, so, so we we'll have, we, address that. Yeah, so we, we can, that yeah. Question, and um, we look forward to providing you those resources. Okay. Yeah, and any... Benny, who was asking for a certificate, we'll also make sure that those go out. So, all right. Okay. Thank Thanks, everybody. Fun. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.